This is Immortal Works Flash Fiction Friday, Episode 79. Fistful of Tengu by David J. West Read by Zach Bjorgi A monk with several weeks' worth of beard walked into the village of Viken. He bore only a short walking staff and the sun-bleached robe on his back. His once black hair now looked frosted with the gray of age. He paused at the crossroads, rubbing his scruffy chin, and gazed up at the snows upon the mountain pass of Arishikagi. The ice gleamed like a crown of stars against slabs of coal-black rock. Below, in the village, spring winds sent the lotus blossoms coursing through the air amid the curling smoke of cook fires. Below, in the village, spring winds sent the lotus blossoms coursing through the air amid the curling smoke of cook fires. He glanced high up the pass, and it seemed for a moment that dark features moved against the stark white of the snows. But there was no avalanche or rumble. The mountain remained still and silent as death on the frozen peaks. For a village in springtime, Viken was also quiet, and only the hammering of the blacksmith's shop rang out in the silence like Buddha's gong. The monk went first to the well for a cool drink of water and then approached the blacksmith. He was amused to see it was not an experienced tradesman, but a young boy of perhaps seven or eight working the hammer and tongs. The boy stopped his work and inquired, Yes? May I help you? I apologize. I didn't mean to disturb you, but your shop was the only sound I heard in town, so I came here first. You're perhaps the youngest smith I've ever seen. The boy sniffed and said, It is only because my father has been taken away. By the magistrate? No. Local shogunate? No. Bandits? No. Worse. What's worse than bandits in a valley fair as this? Monsters in the mountain passes, Tengu and Oni. They have laid claim upon our lands and take what they wish in the night. Some say it is a curse put upon us by the sorcerer Yao Xiang, but I do not know. And your father? He tried to cross the pass while the monster slept. He sought assistance from the daimyo. But we heard his screams. He never made it. Most of the folk here have been taken, were slain, or hide in their hovels. But you work the forge and hammer. I have not else to do, and I accept my fate. Until it comes, I will do as my father and his fathers have, since the day the Yellow Emperor did show men the way of the fire and steel. I am a blacksmith. The monk rubbed his chin, saying, It is good you have balance. Is there a home where I may get sustenance? He rubbed his lean belly. The boy grimaced. My mother has some rice and a few onions. Perhaps there is even some sake. But I would have you earn your meal and work the bellows for me. The monk smiled. You are a good son. The boy, Xian Hu, worked the monk all day and by evening allowed a respite when they retired to eat. The mother, a taciturn woman, made the meal as her son had promised. They sat by the fire watching the mountain turn purple in the darkness before finally becoming a deeper shade of black against the vaulted night sky. Here and there upon the mountain were stars just like in the heavens, but these moved across the treacherous snows utterly unlike anything the monk had seen before. Xian Hu, noticed and commented. It is the Oni and Tengu. They dance in the passes, likely toying with some poor soul who ventured that way. What more can you tell me about them? Do they have a lord? The mother gasped, her first audible utterance since Xian Hu brought the monk inside their humble home. It is not meet to speak of such things. It but invites them. Xian Hu shook his head. If that is our fate, so be it. There is said to be a demon lord of the Tengu, but no one alive has confirmed this. Surely some samurai has come to win honor and defeat them. Yes, nodded Chen Hu vigorously. Many have, but it is said no weapon forged by man can hurt the Tengu. All the heroes that went to the mountain have never returned. No weapon forged by man, eh? The mother spoke with a biting curt voice. Monk, you had best return the way you came. There will only be unhappiness in our valley. It is our lot. The monk shook his head. No. In the morning I shall go and speak with these monsters, and bid them leave you in peace. And if they will not? asked Xian Hu. 
his mother stood and shouted down at the egoless monk. How can you go where so many mighty men have failed? To Xian Hu, she said, We have wasted the last of our rice upon a fool who will only die tomorrow. Mother, your manners. She went into another room and wept. Forgive me, we are but a poor cursed people. No forgiveness is necessary, said the monk. I will take care of this problem in the morning. With that, he sipped the last of his sake and rolled over to go to sleep. Xian Hu, however, could not sleep. The egoless monk knew something he had not yet revealed and obviously was not disturbed over encountering the murderous monsters. The morning would bring a very interesting turn of events. The monk slept in, well beyond the rising of the red sun. Xian Hu's mother complained under her breath that it was merely cowardice in his laziness. But when the monk stirred, she became silent. He did his morning prayers, stretching and refreshed himself with cool water from the well. He gazed up at the mountain pass and turned to bid farewell to Xian Hu and his mother. I'm going with you. If you wish. No! I will not have my son journey with you and your assured death. She held her arms across Xian Hu, holding him back. Listen to your mother, said the monk. He turned and walked up the path, never once looking back to see what the boy and his mother did. It was midday before he reached the high pass where the path disappeared between twin mountain peaks. It was colder here, but not so much that the monk concerned himself. The chief danger was the glare of the sun upon the snow and ice, blinding him. He kept a hand over his eyes as he squinted against the dazzling white backdrop. The wind whipped about him and almost had a malevolent voice, whispering threats. The monk made a gesture of Kujukiri with his fingers and the spell of wind ceased. A gentle crack high above erupted with a shower of thunder. A rock slide raced down toward the path. The monk, more agile than he appeared, sidestepped and jumped behind a sheltering overhang hardly big enough for a dog. As the rolling stone settled, he came out and looked above. Something intangible stirred, and the monk continued up the pass with a spry and wary step. He heard them before he saw them, cackling laughter with either mischievous undertones or deep bass rumbles of stifled laughter. The monsters were more easily seen from the corners of his vision than directly. They enjoyed the terror they believed they inflicted upon men, the blood turning to ice as men let fear rule them. But the monk continued higher up the trail, never acknowledging the demonic chuckling or malicious taunts. When the monsters had enough of being ignored, they called out, Is this one of those deaf and dumb? Does the insect not feel the doom that is upon him? It was then a dozen of the crow man-like Tengu and a score of the ogreish Oni fully revealed themselves from behind fields of glamour. They cloistered about the monk as if to attack and feed upon his flesh. Paying them no mind, the monk said, I would speak with your lord, for I have a message for his ears alone. This caused alarm and concern among the monsters, for what man would dare presume to have a message for their demonic lord? A towering oni roared at the monk, sounding like the hurricane and avalanche combined. But the monk yawned, Do not waste my time any further. Fetch your lord immediately, for I have a message for him. The monsters looked to each other and nodded. A black-winged Tengu sprang up and flew into the mist-shrouded clouds near the frozen peak. He returned a short moment later. Our lord comes and he will himself feed upon your flesh for your insolence, spoke the fiend. The monk said nothing to this, but waited. The beat of powerful wings, much louder than the other Tengus, thumped closer. Where the Oni wore but loincloths and carried hammers and naginatas, the Tengu wore robes of fine silk and wielded katanas. The Tengu lord was dressed in even richer apparel. His silken robe bore many devices and patterns of gold and scarlet. His sword handle was wrought with dragon skin and gems, a gold crown perched upon his ebon brow, and his beak seemed to quiver with what could only be an insidious and cruel smile. It was hard to tell with a beak. His voice was like thunder, and he said, booming, a mortal dares to demand my presence. You will be especially tortured unless you speak a truly valuable message. It is. Oh, Lord of the Mountain, it is. I ask for you and your servants to depart, never to return, said the monk. 
The Tengu's eyes of jet bore into the monk before blinking and laughter erupted from the Tengu lord. You are the boldest fool I have ever met, and what if I refuse your offer? Then what? It will hurt, spoke the monk placidly. The Tengu lord raged. Slay him! But remaining almost still as cold stone, the monk raised his hand. I have insulted your lordship. Perhaps we could compose a challenge for us both, so that you might regain your honor. Incredulous, the Tengu lord shot back. Me! Regain my honor! I have lost nothing. What challenge would you have for us, fool? A challenge of life and death. You know no weapons forged by man can hurt me. Yes. And still you wish to challenge me? Yes. Very well. Your doom is upon you. They rounded on each other, the Tengu lord standing nearly a foot taller than the monk. Quick jabs with sharp talons rained down upon the old monk, to which the monk casually blocked. Raging, the Tengu lord attacked all the fiercer, but quick as he was, he could not grasp the monk in his shining talons. The monk still only blocked the Tengu lord's attacks. Tell me who you are, monk. To be such a skilled opponent, I would know your name, said the Tengu lord. Musashi, Miyamoto. I have come seeking the void and to find worthy adversaries. I have found only you. The monsters all blinked and surprised at facing the famed sword saint, even without his katana. Bolstering his own failing courage, the Tengu lord shouted, Perhaps you are the greatest human warrior alive, but you have no weapon that can harm me. I am the weapon, not forged by man, said Musashi as his hand shot out and took the Tengu lord's beak in his left hand. The Tengu's eyes grew wide with fear. Never before had anyone been able to lay their hands upon him. He pulled back, but Musashi's grip tightened even to the point of placing two fingers into the nostrils. Horror filled the monster's black soul as he watched... M Horror filled the monster's black soul as he watched Musashi's right hammer-like fist raise. The fist came down at the base of the beak and smote it free. Holding the beak in his fist, Musashi said, You had the choice between blessing and curse. I grant your wish. Screaming and in painful shock, the Tengu lord suddenly went silent as Musashi slammed the broken beak into his feather-covered heart. The monstrous lord fell in the snow, his crimson blood staining the whiteness. Facing the rest of them with his bloody fist, Musashi spoke softly. Weapons need to be constantly sharpened and used. Sometimes they break. He cast the beak at their feet. Who is next? The monsters turned and fled, some melting away into the fog and others taking wing heading south. The Tengu lord's body shifted, cracked, and fell apart in the snows as if it were thousands of years old. The beak on the snows turned to dust and blew away on the wind. Musashi then continued on his journey. Thanks for listening to Immortal Works Flash Fiction Friday. For more from this author, please follow him on Twitter at David underscore J West. Also, if you have a flash fiction story you want us to read on this podcast, you can submit it to us on our website at immortal-works.com. Please don't forget to review, rate, and share our podcast. It really helps us grow our audience. If Keanu Reeves was real, he would give us a five-star rating. So you should, too. Do I sound sexy? Mm. <laughs> do you like that? I do. Do you like that? I just don't know if I should do an accent or not. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't mean to disturb you. He's like Master Splinter. Right. <laughs> should I do Master Splinter? Uh, I better not. Fair enough. The boy stopped his work and inquired. Yes, may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> How can you go with so many... <laughs> where, where are you going? What are you doing? Oh, God. <sighs> okay, I just had a... What, what just happened?